Welcome to SK University. Today's illumination is Lighting Controls 101, Power Systems and Load Switching. When talking about electricity, there are three basic units of measurement, voltage, current, and resistance. The water flow analogy is commonly used to describe their relationship. Voltage can be thought of as the amount of water pressure. Current represents the volume of water flow through the pipe. Resistance is the pipe diameter. A large pipe diameter equates to a small resistance to water flow, and a small pipe diameter equates to a large resistance to flow. Ohm's law defines the mathematical relationship between voltage, current, resistance, and power, which is measured in watts. Current times resistance equals voltage. Current times voltage equals power. When it comes to designing a lighting system, it is important to understand how to calculate lighting power loads in order to properly specify the correct control equipment and properly load our electrical circuits. The National Electrical Code allows loading of branch circuits to 80%, which means a 20 amp circuit can only be loaded to 16 amps. So, if we have a 20 amp branch circuit and we're operating at 120 volts, how much of a lighting load can we put on that circuit? The answer would be 16 amps times 120 volts, or 1920 watts. What if we were operating at 277 volts instead? The answer would be 16 amps times 277 volts, or 4,432 watts. Electrical power is supplied as either direct current, or DC, or as alternating current, or AC. DC provides a constant voltage over time. Common sources of DC are batteries, or DC power supplies that convert AC into DC, like a charger that you might use to charge the battery in your phone. That type of DC power supply takes AC from a wall outlet in a building and converts it to DC at the USB connector. Solar panels also produce DC. Your car runs on DC. When you plug something like a phone charger into the cigarette lighter of your car, you are connecting to 12 volts DC provided by your car's electrical system. AC provides a voltage that varies over time. It starts at zero volts and rises to some maximum positive value, then it drops back to zero and continues to some maximum negative value, and then rises back to zero. The most common source of AC is the power grid. Other sources include generators that we might use to supply temporary power when the grid is down. Inverters like those from Emergilite and Crucial Power Products convert DC from batteries to AC to be used as backup power sources. Anyone with solar panels needs to use an inverter to convert DC from the panels to AC to power devices in their building. AC cycles this way over time because of how it's generated. As we turn the shaft of a generator, be it with steam generated by burning fuel, or with wind, or with water in a hydroelectric plant, the voltage that is output by the generator varies based on the rotation angle of the shaft. We measure the rotation of the shaft in degrees, where a complete rotation is 360 degrees. We measure where we are in our AC cycle the same way, with the start of the cycle being 0 degrees, the midpoint being 180, and the end being 360. This waveform shape is called a sine wave. And that's because if you were to plot the phase angle in degrees on the x-axis versus the sine of the angle on the y-axis, you would get this waveform. This isn't important for our discussion today, but at least you know where the name comes from. The number of cycles that occur per second are measured in hertz, abbreviated HZ. In North America, our power grid operates at 60 hertz. So the voltage goes through this cycle 60 times per second. Other parts of the world, like Europe, 
operate their grid at 50 Hz. Most appliances or electronics that you might purchase are rated to operate at 50 or 60 Hz for global compatibility. Single or multifamily houses are usually supplied with what is called a split phase power system. The building is fed by a transformer, which is a device that takes one voltage in and gives us another out. You may see a transformer on a utility pole outside your home, or perhaps in a utility cabinet if your home is fed by underground utilities. That transformer is fed on the power grid side by a high voltage, and it steps it down to a lower voltage that we use in our home. The transformer gives us three electrical connections with which to power our home. There are two outputs and a neutral. The outputs start their cycles 180 degrees apart. This is described as being 180 degrees out of phase. Each output provides 120 volts AC relative to the neutral and 240 volts relative to each other. A 120 volt outlet has a connection to one of the outputs and the neutral. If you have a power cord with a third connection, that is a connection to ground for safety and is literally a connection to the earth. An outlet that looks like one of these has connections to both outputs and neutral and is used to provide power to appliances that use a lot of energy, like electric ranges and electric clothes dryers. Large buildings are usually supplied by what is referred to as a three-phase power system. Each of the phases are typically referred to as phase A, B, and C. A three-phase generator produces each phase equally apart in terms of time, so the phases are separated by 360 degrees divided by 3, or 120 degrees. Phase B starts 120 degrees after phase A, and phase C starts 120 degrees after phase B. With a three-phase power system, we are provided with a connection to each phase as well as neutral. A ground connection is provided for safety as well. Just as with a split-phase power system, a three-phase power system provides us with two different voltages, the phase-to-neutral voltage and the phase-to-phase -phase voltage. With a 120-208 volt power system, the phase-to-neutral voltage is 120 volts and the phase-to-phase -phase voltage is 208 volts. We will also see the 277-480 volt power system in the United States. In Canada, you will find the 347-600 volt power system in addition to the other two. Lighting control systems often use an electrical component called a relay to perform the task of switching lighting loads. Inside the relay is a coil of specially wound wire. When electricity is run through that coil, it generates a magnetic field. The magnetic field exists until the electricity is removed. If you have ever seen an electromagnetic crane at work in a scrapyard, you've seen electromagnetism at work. On the end of the crane is an electromagnet, the heart of which is a coil of wire. When the operator wants to pick up some scrap metal, electricity is applied to the coil and metal is attracted to the electromagnet. When the crane is positioned where the operator wants to place the metal, the electricity is switched off and the metal falls away from the crane. The first type of relay we'll look at is the electrically held, normally open type. In a normally open relay, there are contacts that are used to switch power to the load, which are kept open or apart by a spring. That is why it's called normally open. To turn the load on, we apply electricity to the coil. In lighting control systems, that coil voltage is usually a relatively low voltage that is supplied by a sensor or computer. The coil produces enough magnetic force to override the tension of the spring and pull the contacts together. The load will stay on as long as the coil is energized. When the coil is de-energized, the spring will pull the contacts apart and the load is switched off. An electrically held normally closed relay works the opposite way from a normally open one. Normally, that is when the coil is de-energized, 
the spring holds the contacts together or closed, and the load is on. We turn the load off by energizing the coil with our control signal. The energized coil creates enough magnetic force to override the spring tension and opens the contacts. The load will switch on again when the coil is de-energized. The third type of relay we'll talk about is the mechanically held type, which is also referred to as mechanically latched or latching. All three descriptors refer to the same type of relay. This type of relay has two coils that move an armature to one of two positions to open or close the contacts. Rather than keeping the coil continuously energized, as with an electrically held relay, we just quickly pulse the coil to move the armature and then de-energize the coil. The armature is held in place mechanically. Sometimes this type of relay will feature a mechanism for manually moving the armature by hand, allowing someone to turn the load on or off without pulsing a coil. Here's an actual electrically held relay, and it has a clear plastic case so we can see all of the relay components that we've been talking about. The spring is visible up top, the coil is wrapped in a yellow protective jacket, the copper contacts can be seen on the lower right. We make electrical connections to the contacts and the coil via the terminals on the bottom. This is a mechanically latched relay. This particular model offers a manual override to allow someone to change the state of the relay to switch connected loads on or off manually. The override also provides a visual indication of the state of the relay. Here we have an example of a component of a lighting control system. This control module is designed to mount on a luminaire or an electrical box. It receives commands from the system controller and switches and dims loads in response. It switches the load with a relay that is internal to the module. This is a relay panel. These panels come in various sizes and house multiple relays in one enclosure. Some relay panels operate independently with their own internal controller, while others are part of a system and react to commands sent to it by the system controller. A luminaire has two power connections and a connection to ground. Those power connections could be to phase and neutral or to two phases. It depends on the voltage required to operate the luminaire. When we switch power to a luminaire, we have to make or break all live connections, but neutral and ground remain connected. In relay parlance, a set of contacts is referred to as a pole. If our luminaire is powered phase to neutral, that means we have one live electrical connection that needs to be switched. That only requires one set of contacts, so we can use a single pole relay. If our luminaire is powered phase to phase, we have two live electrical connections which must be switched. That requires two sets of contacts or a two-pole relay. The operating voltage of the luminaire tells us which type of relay we need to use to control the luminaire. Any phase-to-neutral voltage requires a single-pole relay, and any phase-to-phase -phase voltage requires a two-pole relay. Here we have some sight lighting that is powered phase-to-phase. -phase. To switch this load, we need a two-pole relay to switch both phases at once. Here we have some interior lighting that is powered phase to neutral. We don't need to switch the neutral. We just need to switch the one live connection from phase C. We can use a single pole relay here. Another device you may encounter is the contactor. You can think of a contactor as a large relay. Contactors are designed to switch very large electrical loads. Because of that, they may contain components that are designed to suppress the electrical arcs that occur when a load is switched on or off, which is not a feature commonly found in relays. They also tend to be multipole devices and are almost exclusively available as electrically held, normally open. Contactors are commonly used to switch exterior lighting loads under the control of a time clock, photocell, or lighting control system. 
where it is common for relays to have low voltage coils that are suitable for control by a computer, contactors tend to have line voltage driven coils. That is why it's not uncommon to find a control device driving a relay with the relay switching the line voltage to the contactor coil. That wraps up our discussion of power systems and load switching. Thank you for spending time with us today. We hope you found this illumination helpful. If you would like to learn more about how lighting controls can be applied in your next project, please contact your SK and Associates salesperson, and they will be happy to put you in touch with a member of our controls team. Have a great day.